We begin this part with the view of the main building of the Baskerville clan where the patriarch and main family stay. Hugo passes on an envelope across the table, telling Vicar about how they have received a notice from the academy. He reminds Vicar about their past promise from before, that he would enter the academy when the time comes. Reading the letter inside the envelope, Vicar could see that it was a notice from Colosio, a notice for the students of class 20. Looking at it, he was right in his thought, that this was the reason why Hugo had summoned him here. The largest educational institution that the Grand Empire Rock is facilitating, the academy called Colosio. If you manage to graduate from the academy, you would be able to start the elite course at the Imperial Palace or even a higher floor. Back in his past life, before the regression, Vicar had attended the academy as the triplet server and was in charge of handling all of their tedious tasks for them. Since he entered the academy with numerous scars on his face and had a limp, Vicar was scorned by the nobles from the academy. But in his current life, those bad memories of the academy didn't bother him now. Hugo wanted to know if the triplets, whom Vicar had asked to go with would be all right, he was also curious on whether there was anyone else beside them that he would like to take with him. Before answering Hugo's question, Vicar wanted to ask about something else. He recalled that two years ago, due to him going missing, Hugo had received a letter stating that he will obtain a huge benefit from the Morgue family, and that Vicar would be given a reward. So he asked Hugo if he was right, Hugo replies that he is and wanted to know what that something was that Vicar wanted. Vicar tells him that he wanted Hugo to share a story as the reward, which got Hugo's attention, seeing his reaction, Vicar takes it that he had permitted him to ask. So our boy, at point blank, asks Hugo about his dead wife and daughter, straight to his face. Vicar's question was horrifying enough to make Barrymore panic and tremble with fear as he heard what Vicar had requested from Hugo. Hugo, on the other hand, had taken a moment before asking Vicar about what he had just said to him. So our boy replies back, with no fear in his eyes, he asks Hugo about Ms. Roxana, the first wife who has passed. And the daughter that was born from Hugo and Ms. Roxana, Vicar wanted him to tell him about Miss Penelope as well. A whole mixture of emotions started to stir within the all-powerful Hugo, as his face was darkened, wondering how Vicar knew those names. He unleashed the bloodhound Red Fury eyes, scolding Vicar and wondering the reason behind his question. Hugo was going to be extremely furious if he found out that Vicar was asking out of petty curiosity. In a calm manner and with his hand across his heart, Vicar calmly tells Hugo that he needed to first hear his answer in order for him to reveal the reason behind the sudden questions. He assures Hugo, who was in an explosive angry state, that the questions were not due to mere curiosity. Hugo's thoughts about his first wife whom he met through an arranged marriage, and his eldest daughter who was kidnapped by the barbarians. That's all crucial information that Vicar needed in order to reveal Pomerian's existence to Hugo. There was also the hard-to-believe fairy tale that Barrymore had told Vicar about when he was much younger. The story about how Hugo was an affectionate family man who loved his first wife, Ms. Roxana, very much. But Vicar was sure that he couldn't let Hugo meet Pomerian based on that. This was something that he needed to check for himself. After hearing Vicar's reply to his question, Hugo continued to remain silent for some time. After some time had passed, he finally opened his mouth. Gripping his chest tightly and his face darkened to the point where you couldn't see his facial expression. The ice-cold bloodhound demon that everyone feared in the family, started to tell Vicar about how Roxana was the only darling who he loved with all his heart. And that his precious daughter, Penelope, was his most precious treasure. This sincere and lovable answer was enough to stun Vicar to the point that the artist had to draw him in another art style. Vicar couldn't believe that the word darling had actually come out from Hugo's mouth. Hugo continues on about his story, telling Vicar honestly that Roxana and him were not in an arranged marriage. He revealed the fact that Roxana was a commoner who had nothing. He could still remember the day that they first met clearly. It was love at first sight. Wow, I didn't expect Hugo to have a K-drama moment. Hearing the story from Hugo, Vicar could sense that he was going to start from the first time he met her. Hugo continues on about his past love story, revealing that his love with Roxana was very difficult. She had tried to distance herself from him because of her humble background, so Hugo decided to abandon everything and went with her. Whoa, turns out that Hugo was a hopeless romantic and gigachod. Because for her, Hugo was willing to throw away everything, not only his physical body but his soul too. Vicar interrupted Hugo as he was telling his story, he was grateful for sharing that with him but he wanted Hugo to go to the next point quickly. 
but Hugo interrupts Vikir, shouting at him with the word but, and continuing on with his love story, he tells Vikir that his love with Roxana was put to the test once again. In order to capture them, who were on the run, the Baskerville family had sent pursuers. For the sake of protecting Roxana, Hugo fought with his life on the line and with everything he had. They had walked a thorny path, covered with multiple attacks and dead bodies, was the path they had to walk where no one blessed their love. Hugo recalled that they had thought about giving up, but they persevered due to their love for each other. Akathut that was only the start to their harsh beginning, Hugo and Roxana managed to break through to their disagreeing parents and had gotten married. Hearing the sweet tale of Hugo's love story was enough for Barrymore to shed some tears, I feel you brother. And so, through Hugo's and Roxana's resolve, their precious daughter Penelope was born. His loving wife and daughter beside him, Hugo wanted to protect this happinesses that he obtained after through such much suffering and struggling. But this is where things start to get dark, after giving birth, Roxana's health started to deteriorate instantly, in the end, she left the world and left behind their young daughter Penelope. Thankfully, Penelope grew up to be a bright and charming child. She had inherited Hugo's strong mentality and Roxana's loving heart, and she had received love from all of the Baskervilles. Hugo was already happy enough to know that his Penelope was doing that well. But then a certain incident occurred, just the mere mention of it was enough for him to unleash his bloodhound aura and crush the corner of his seat. The incident was when Penelope, who went out for a walk, was captured by the Lococo tribe. A bunch of questions flooded his mind as he investigated how this happened. How did those barbarians come into the middle of the Baskerville territory? How did they kidnap Penelope? Hugo's eyes were filled with rage as he couldn't figure it out back then. And until now, he couldn't find any trace of Penelope. Vikir's eyes started to glow as he listened closely to Hugo's story. With Penelope missing, Hugo used that as the justification to widen the Empire's region, that was when Hugo started to look for Penelope and to subjugate the barbarians. But after a while, Hugo felt that doing this alone was difficult so he increased the number of his wives through arranged marriages and he started to mass produce offsprings. And decades later, although stationed at the border, Hugo had created a powerful family that no one could look down on. That's how the Iron Blood Baskerville family was born. Hugo's cold-blooded nest to restore the family and for the Empire's glory. But behind that cruel soul was a man that was hurt deeply due to the loss of the family that he had loved with all his heart. But so what? thought Vikir. He knew that all villains have a backstory, the evil deeds that they committed are all that remained. Vikir could only see Hugo as a heartless human being who mass-produced offspring and sent them to the battlefield. But still, he now understood how precious Roxana and Penelope were to him. And so, Hugo was done with his story, with a mad expression on his face after recalling his painful past. He now wanted to know Vikir's reason behind why he had asked about his wife and daughter. Before telling him the reason, Vikir took something out of his pocket and presented it onto the table before Hugo, telling him to take a look at it first. The moment he gazed at it, Hugo shouted out loud, recognizing what it was. He recognized the pendant as the one that he had made for Roxana, which was last seen on Penelope before her disappearance. Opening the pendant, he could see a tiny picture of his family portrait within it. Gazing at it, Hugo held his tears back or at least that's what I think. As Vikir turns to the door, he asks Hugo about what he would do if Miss Penelope's successor was alive. His question was enough to leave both old men stunned with their mouths wide open. As he walks closer to the doors, Vikir tells Hugo about Miss Penelope's daughter, revealing to Hugo that he has a granddaughter. As the doors to the room opened, a familiar sweet angel voice called out to her uncle. The moment she entered the room, Hugo's entire world was flipped upside down, and had turned from color to X-ray colors. Looking at Pomerian Kozily pulling onto Vikir's shirt, he recalls that she was the child from their previous meeting. This was when Vikir reveals to Hugo that he had lied to him, that while at the forest, there was a child that he met in the Lococo tribe's region. And that she called the person who gave her the pendant as mommy. Hugo couldn't believe it, that this little girl had called his sweet precious daughter Penelope as mommy. His hand started to tremble as he held onto the pendant, while Pomerian still looked at him all scared. Vikir, on the other hand, was excited as his eyes glowed bright red, he wanted Hugo to be confused. He knew that Pomerian was a child whose blood is mixed with someone Hugo loves, and with something he despised. As Hugo stood in front of Pomerian, Vikir started to wonder if he could keep his composure in front of her. Looking closely at Pomerian this time, 
Hugo towers over her enough to cast a shadow onto the sweet little angel. He recalled that Vikir had found her in Lokoko, his eyes and demoners started to unleash the fearsome bloody bloodhound aura, questioning whether Pomerian was someone that was born from his daughter and a barbarian. Vikir tells him that it was true, his eyes were focused on Hugo completely, as he watches his shake with rage and despair. Hugo started to stretch his hand towards Pomerian, who could only stare at it as it came closer to her. Vikir was counting on this to lead to Hugo's ruin, because once he is, that is when his revenge will begin. We now turn to a sunny day in a beautiful park where the bright voice of laughter could be heard loudly in the area. Osiris, Vikir and Barrymore were standing side by side with one another as Hugo asks a question, is my beard that interesting? Is it fun pulling it? He was asking these questions to Pomerian who was playing with his beard, she even told him that Grandpapa's beard was dirty. The moment the word Grandpa left her mouth, Hugo started to ask Pomerian if she had really called him Grandpa. Osiris was the first to comment out loud that even though he hadn't lived for a long time, he had never been so surprised in his life. Barrymore, on the other hand, had lived for a long time but still he agrees with what Osiris had said. Meanwhile, Vikir was silent, he continued to look at Hugo and Pomerian, wondering what was going on. The Hugo that he knew of right now, the image he had of him in his mind, had just been brutally shattered into a million pieces. As Hugo covered his face after being called a grandpa, tears started to flow out endlessly from his eyes, as he couldn't believe that the day he would be called a grandpa would come. Seeing Hugo's sudden reaction and crying face made Vikir stunned as he looked down. His world had started to flip as well and he wonders why the cold-hearted bloodhound known as Hugo Le Baskerville would have that kind of expression on his face. We now turn to when Vikir van Baskerville was 15 years old after regressing. As he stood in front of the all-powerful Hugo Le Baskerville, Vikir suddenly wondered about a certain question. Can he assassinate Hugo? The first answer to that question was impossible. When one reaches the level of Swordmaster, they obtain an unwavering mind. Because of that, Vikir couldn't even find an opening during Hugo's daily life. So he gave up on the thought of assassinating Hugo, and after many years, he found Pomerian. The daughter of Penelope, whom Hugo truly loved. The wave of emotions that would be felt when meeting Pomerian, could possibly affect the Swordmaster. With refined swordsmanship, Beelzebub and the Madam's poison, the possibility of assassinating Hugo increased as time passed. And today was supposed to be the cornerstone for Hugo's assassination. But as Vikir looks towards his target that he was planning to kill, he wonders why Hugo was laughing right now, as though he was happy. Seeing this side of Hugo, Vikir started to waver in his conviction to kill the man in front of him, while thinking why Hugo isn't confused. We return to the moment where Vikir introduced Pomerian as Penelope's daughter and Hugo's granddaughter. As the big man walked over to Pomerian, he wondered if she was truly his precious Penelope's daughter. As he stretched his hand towards Pomerian, his shadow could be seen within her eyes. Looking right at Hugo, she tells him that Penelope was her mommy's name, which causes Hugo to shudder for a moment as sweat drops appear on his face. Holding his rough hand with her tiny hands, Pomerian tells Hugo about how her mommy always said that she missed her daddy, and that she always kept looking at the necklace, all of these were things that she had remembered. Looking at Hugo with her innocent eyes, Pomerian asks him if he was her grandpa. Looking at her and hearing her question, Hugo's mind immediately turns to a past memory of when Penelope was alive and cheerful, he could hear her clear and joyful voice calling him father. The man known as the cold-hearted bloodhound of the Baskerville family, had to grit his teeth in order to hide what he was feeling. But it didn't work as he muttered out Penelope's name as he bends forward while trembling, catching Vikir's attention. The all-powerful man had finally broken down as tears started to flow endlessly from his eyes. He could only kneel in front of Pomerian, with his head down, he continued to cry out loud in front of everyone. The flashback ends as Barrymore tells Vikir thank you. He couldn't believe that he would get to see the patriarch smiling like that right now as it always seemed like a far-fetched dream of his. And it was all thanks to Vikir, hearing that, Vikir was confused about how the situation happened because of him. Hugo's smiling face, Pomerian being reunited with her grandpa, Barrymore seeing his dream come true, Osiris was even smiling himself. As though he was holding in his anger with his hand trembling, Vikir decides to let it go. Because right now, he didn't know that by standing before Hugo, who has so many openings, Vikir felt so helpless for some reason. The day soon turned to night as we returned to the place where Vikir was staying. He laid out flat on his bed, staring endlessly at the ceiling, 
pondering his thoughts about the events that had happened so far. Looking back, he started to think about the Hugo that he had remembered. In his past life where he was captured and faced Hugo, he shouted at him that he was innocent and wondered why he wasn't listening to him. Vikir wanted to know if Hugo was really going to blame him for all of the Baskerville's sins. But Hugo simply replied that he didn't want to listen to a sinner. Hugo even revealed that he knew about how Vikir was secretly communicating with a demon and had even kidnapped innocent children and offered them to the demon. But these were false accusations that Vikir tried to deny with all his might. But before he could speak of his innocence, Hugo swung his sword in a single swing, cutting off Vikir's tongue as he didn't want to be called by such a filthy thing like Vikir. He even calls Vikir trash as his bloodhound eyes glowed fiercely red. But our boy didn't give up, his eyes were still filled with anger and hatred for Hugo even after having his tongue cut off, the man who turned him into a sinner and executed him in the end. But in our present time, the young Vikir who was still laying down on his bed, was wondering why he was starting to hesitate to take revenge. As he laid there, a voice spoke out, telling him that it was rare for her to see such a lethargic expression on his face. Cindy had appeared at his window once again, dressed like Catwoman. Looking at his current state, she wonders why he had called for her, only to be just laying in bed. Vikir could only ask her about the reason why she was here. Cindy took out another report, telling Vikir that she had brought him what he requested. She slams the report right onto Vikir's face, reminding him that he had asked her to investigate Set Le Baskerville. As she sat on his bed, Cindy questions Vikir about why he looked like he lost everything. But since she was busy, she was just going to give him the report. Even after being slammed with a report on his face, Vikir remained silent. Sensing that something was definitely off, Cindy reports that she had just done a detailed investigation on Set Le Baskerville. She found out that he has sponsored several orphanages under a fake identity. As a sponsor, it seems like he had taken responsibility for their adoption. But there was no information about the people who adopted the children, she couldn't even locate the children who were adopted too. Since Vikir mentioned that he was a demon, then the situation was bad. She knew the obvious reason behind why a demon would be kidnapping children. It was to use the children as sacrifices or food. She concluded that Set La Baskerville might be connected to Underdog City's missing children's case. Looking and reading through the report, Vikir concluded that he had missed this information. The fact that the current Set is a demon, means that the Set, whom Vikir had served in his previous life before his regression was also a demon. Vikir also figured out that the person who gave the information that Hugo was going to frame and kill him with was this a-hole. A past memory of when Set was visiting Vikir in prison was seen. He hid his face behind his hand, calling Vikir pitiful. Because in order for Hugo to frame him for all of Baskerville's sins, he was going to hasten his execution. With a creepy smile across his face, Set lies about how he was so sad that he couldn't help him. Anger immediately arose in Vikir's face as he placed the pieces together from his previous life and now. He couldn't believe it. We now turn to a young boy, asking the Sir beside him about where they were. The man holding the lantern introduces the place they were at as the young boy's new home, which startles the kid. He looked around all nervous, saying that the headmaster had mentioned that he had been adopted into a good family, but looking at what was in front of him was simply a cave. It turns out that the man was Set La Baskerville, who tells the young boy that there seems to be a misunderstanding, as his appearance started to change, Set tells the young boy that the cave isn't the house he'll be staying in, but the place he will be going to. Set's appearance had completely changed as the young boy looked at him with fear in his eyes and confusion everywhere. Set's appearance had completely transformed into a demonic being, with a single eye in the center and sharp fangs all around with tentacles. Ew just ew, the young boy could only stare and do nothing as tears filled his eyes, his last word was calling out for his mommy, as Set devoured him completely, leaving behind only blood and the shoes that the young boy wore previously. As he regains his human form, Set could only smile and mention that children sure are the tastiest. Set licks the blood off his face, smiling as though he was turned on by eating kids. After all, he couldn't help himself. It turns out that this was no longer Set La Baskerville, but actually a being who was a part of the demon's ten elite corpses, the tenth corpse, known as Andromalius. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.